Well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts and philosophy, theology, nature, and life. And uh, I love thinking about cool stuff. So come think with me. This is part two of uh, of Lord Willing. It's going to be part three parts of uh, a conversation with Dr. Brandon Rickabaugh on his dissertation. And um, we've, we've been getting a lot of things, uh, just philosophy of mind in general. Um, it, for ep- episode one, if you if you haven't seen it, go back and watch that. It's kind of a uh, an office hours uh, take where I'm just pumping him for for answers, and uh, he he did such a fantastic job. Part two here, we're going to get into a little bit more of what he's covered in his dissertation. So uh, without further ado, Brandon, thanks uh, for coming on the podcast again. Yeah, this is fun. Really appreciate it. For, for the listeners, um, can you explain, uh, can you summar up, summarize uh, what we talked about in, in episode one? Yeah, we talked about a lot, um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, su- I'll summarize what I think is um, necessary to get the argument that we'll talk about um, and today. today. Um, and so we talked about what consciousness is specifically phenomenal consciousness and then what is phenomenal unified consciousness. So um, a state of phenomenal consciousness. Um, so for any mental state M, um, when it when that mental state is had by some subject S, that uh, M is a state of phenomenal consciousness, just if when S has M, uh, there is a what it's like to experience M. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be a what it's like to experience the greenness, you know, of my pen. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's the that's the phenomenal state versus, you know, the sort of access consciousness, which is um, something like in a state of access consciousness, I have the ability, usually introspection, to retrieve some data about an experience, let's say a memory or something like that. But yeah. pre- presume that the distinction is supposed to be their block thinks because there is at least a conceptual difference between the two. Yeah, um, having an experience of green and recalling the information about green, let's say. Yeah, um, and then there is this um, further phenomenon which philosophers and neuroscientists refer to as um, the unity of consciousness. And then what I'm interested in particular is the phenomenal unity of consciousness. Mm. So the example that we that I gave last time and that is in the the dissertation, which I'm slowly turning into a book, is um, this experience you have in a museum. So imagine you're in a museum. And you're you're aware you're having this phenomenal state at a particular time, um, so that's important. We're, I'm talking about phenomenally unified states of consciousness at a particular time, not over time. And uh, so I have it in one moment. I have an experience of say the redness of the painting, and then I have an experience of the depth dynamics of me standing before the painting and the painting being on the wall. And, and the wall itself and say the frame. At the same time, let's you know say I'm fidgeting with my pen or a coin in my pocket. I have this tactile experience. Um, say also I'm, I, I experience the smell of coffee. And then let's say also I hear you know a conversation happening you know not too far away from me. So what you have there are a whole bunch of different phenomenal states, the experience of red, the experience of depth, the experience, um, of the smell of coffee, of the feel of the pen, uh, the audio experience of the conversation, but you're not. You, but but what you're having though too is as the phenomenal experience of what it's like to have all of those states of consciousness at once. Yeah. And you, if you attend merely to the ontological details of the individual phenomenal states, you won't be able to uh, get at. A, a description of the reality of the phenomenal state as a whole. And so phenomenal consciousness seems to be this unified whole state of consciousness that's not reducible to its parts. Yeah. And that's what philosophers are trying to answer in solving the unity of consciousness problem. How is it that a state that that um, you know a complex state could be bound together to be experienced as a holistically unified state? Yeah, um, and then the neuroscientists are trying to figure out: well, um, how is it that a brain that's full of various different mechanisms and parts that are um, sealed off from each other, as it were, can bind together? You know, your visual, tactile, auditory—all these 
different places within the brain somehow bind together to give you the sort of thing that could have an experience of that. Now, what I want to say is that um, both of those problems are interesting, but they're not as important as what I call the subject problem, which is what sort of thing could have a phenomenally the unified state of consciousness? Yeah. Because if you solve the what I'm what I call the field problem, which is how do you bind the field together? Mm -hmm. um, that can be the that you can solve that problem without solving the problem of well, what kind of thing could have that experience? Right. And the binding problem is a little bit closer to that. But if you can solve the problem of what kind of thing could have a state of phenomenally unified consciousness in the way that I think you can solve it, that is by the subject being neurologically simple, then you don't have a field problem. So I think it is really, really important to focus on. Um, and it's a distinct problem from the field problem. And I think that philosophers of mind don't attend to the subject problem because it's a really big problem for them. Yeah. Um, not, not sorry for, for naturalists in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, but also there's this sort of apprehension to even consider a self that's thought to be this sort of weird Cartesian um, sort of thing. So there are other yeah. elements, but I, I think it's the central problem. I, th I think you're totally right there. Uh, is it, do you know the stats on philosophers of mind? Are, are most of them naturalists? Do you, do you have any idea about that? Yeah. I want to say that most of them are, or, or really want to be sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, think that, that um, you know, if you parse out the different naturalist views, um, what you've got are, are mostly physicalists um, mm -hmm. that are, and, and there's going to be some that are, you know, basically the, the main view is is a functionalist naturalism or functionalist physicalism. Okay. And um, that, that's usually, that's the, probably the, the dominant view in the philosophy of mind. And there'll be a non-reductive version of that. It'll be non-reductive with respect to explanation, though, not with respect to um, the metaphysics of consciousness. So it'll yeah. just be the case that at a certain level, biological explanations can't be reduced to explanations in physics. Yeah. But what a subject of consciousness is, is just a aggregate of physical parts. Um, yeah. And then you might have some like Nagel or, or Kim. Uh, well, I would just say stick with Nagel that think um no 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 kim 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 is an advocate of this they would think that no there's there's at least one kind of non-physical property a phenomenal state or qualia but it's not a problem for naturalism because it doesn't do any causal work at all it just sort of dangles there ah oh, is, is that like is, is that epiphenomenalism or is it like yeah. property dualism well you get both so the property dualist thinks that there are two kinds of properties physical and non-physical properties mm -hmm. and the epiphenomenalist thinks that mental states are are non-physical properties and that they're not causally efficacious yeah yeah so you don't ha you don't have to be a epiphenomenalist to be a property dualist okay. but if you want to be a naturalist um I, you're you're going to want to be an epi if you're going to be a naturalist who's a property dualist then you're going to have to think that they that um, epiphenomenalism is true, okay? Because the I mean I think the fair way and this is this is how you know um, Putnam and 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 Swinburne in fact sort of work out naturalism is that anything that could be possibly explained, anything that's got any causal power, is going to be a physical thing. Yeah, maybe there's some other stuff, but it's just not relevant at all. Yeah, really relevant. That seems so nuts to me because because of like the argument from reason and uh yeah well yeah. so before we jump the gun here um can so you did a great job summing up uh part one here in, in part two we're going to go over your specific arguments against uh naturalism can you just lay out your overall argument in your dissertation and then we yeah. can focus in on the details yeah yeah good so what i wanted insofar as it's possible it's really hard you know um, it's really hard to, you know, Alex Proust in particular, like kept pushing me and it took me like a month or so to work this out. Hmm. Um, he's so fun to do philosophy with. So hard to say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so he wanted me to be able to come up with an argument that would cover the logical space with respect to views about subjects of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so what I came up with was a way to do it, um, myriologically. So, um, with an, you know, respect to an ontology of parts. So, I want to say that there are two possible kinds of views about subjects. They're either going to be 
Uh, they're not going to, they're going to be the sorts of things that don't have parts at all, or going to, they're going to be the things that do have parts. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I call one, uh, subject simplicity, no parts. And then the other subject complexity, the, the, the subject has, um, at least one part more specifically, or I want to say that, um, subject simplicity is going to be defined as, um, the subject of phenomenal, phenomenal unified consciousness, um, has no separable parts. And, and we can get into a moment uh, what that means specifically. And that on subject complexity, the subject of con phenomenally unified consciousness has at least one um, uh, separable part. Okay. So if you can, so if that, so on that distinction, you, you get everything into one category or the other. So all of the naturalist, plausible naturalist views are going to fall into subject um, complexity. Mm hmm you'll have an outlier view that Chisholm sort of entertained for a little while where the subject is this atomic physical simple, mm -hmm. um, or you might have uh, an eliminativist or nihilist view where there just isn't a subject. Um, uh, but in terms of the, the views that are defended, all of the naturalist views are going to fall into the subject um, complexity camp. Okay. Um, maybe a sort of, Cosmopsychism won't work, but that's that's why I have a chapter that deals with panpsychism and emergent, and another chapter that deals with emergentism. Yeah. Then everything that falls into the subject simplicity camp is going to be any view that thinks that the subject of consciousness has no separable parts, and so that'll include obviously um, some versions of substance dualism, but not all. It'll include um, some versions of idealism, and it'll include. Um, some kinds of hylomorphism, at least. Okay. And, the, you know, the most obvious one would be, uh, say, the survivalist reading of, of, of Thomas. Yeah. Um, and so uh, um, that, that's a way to parse out the logical space. And so then I move forward and say, well, let's just see whether or not we can come up with arguments that show that um, subject simplicity, uh, subject complexity or, or is false. Because if I can do that, then I've the, the only thing you know the last person standing is is uh, the last theory standing is subject simplicity, and so that's where we've got to go. And um, so in the dissertation, I just consider well, what kind of parts? So if you're comp if you have at least one separable part, what kind of parts are they? So the physicalist is going to say these parts are not conscious. They're states that are not conscious, but when they aggregate together. Con the, um, there'll be there'll be consciousness, uh, you know, at the level say of a brain. Um, the panpsychist is going to say no. The parts themselves are conscious. Mm. Somehow, when they aggregate together, these micro subjects of consciousness will form a macro subject of consciousness, like yeah. you were. Right. And um, and then the emergentist um, could say something like, um, it's going to be the case that when these parts come together, these emergent laws kick in and something new that's over and above the parts mm -hmm. comes into existence. And that's the subject of consciousness. Right. And it seems to me that those are the three live options. And what's interesting, you know, I said that functionalism is the dominant theory in the philosophy of mind. There, there are, there is a trend of that slowly picking up some steam to move towards a panpsychist view. Yeah. Largely because they think it solves the phenomenal unity of, or sorry, the phenomenal, um, phenomenal, con the problem of phenomenal consciousness, because you just front load reality with fundamental um, properties of consciousness. Now, is that, is that the hard problem of consciousness? Yeah. The hard problem of consciousness, the way that, that, that Chalmers, Chalmers, for example, states it is, um, the problem is one of getting deriving the phenomenal facts, um, say, of a state of consciousness from the physical facts. Yeah. So take all the physical facts about a brain state. Um, those don't seem to be there seems to be this gap, um, an explanatory gap um, that can't be bridged to get you the phenomenal facts. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, one way to think of this is in terms of Jackson's Mary argument, if there's a neuroscientist that's omniscient with respect to um, facts about color perception, but is blind, 
Um, Mary, this, this neuroscientist, knows all the propositions, all the physical facts about color perception, but has never experienced what it's like to see color. She gets a she has you know a surgery done or in another you know Jackson's version of it, I think she's colorblind and or she's in a black and white room she leaves the room and sees color for the first time she's learned something new mm -hmm. um, some new fact that 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 the dualist is going to say um, you know is a phenomenal fact that's not reducible to and so how to explain this fact about what it's like to experience red in terms of the physics that she has an understanding of with respect to um, the neurology or the, the fundamentally the physics of color perception um, is is we, we have no explanation of that. Yeah. So the panpsychist then says, well, here's here's a way to avoid that. Just front load consciousness into the world. Mm -hmm. So what you have are fundamental physical things um, that have um, different kinds of properties. Science studies the quantitative properties. You know the, the the height, weight, spin. You know these sorts of things, um, and but is not is ill suited to explore and understand the qualitative properties, mm -hmm. the phenomenal facts. But the phenomenal facts are fundamental facts, features of the physical universe, and so they're just basic. They're there. So in the same way, a theist wants to say, um, how do you you know um, God is uh, fundamentally there, basic, primitively there. And so the panpsychist and the theist have this sort of same sort of assumption in their metaphysics, and that's fundamentally consciousness um, or the mental is um, at the bottom of reality. Yeah, it's just the panpsychist wants to say that it's all there are also physical thing, you know, physical properties that are at the the, the bottom of of reality. Well, and and the, so you don't have to explain the, phys the, the the you don't have to explain the 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 phenomenal facts in terms of the physical facts because the phenomenal facts are just there and the physical facts are just there and they attach to the same fundamental part of reality. Yeah. I, I always thought that that panpsychist view is kind of like an emergent view in that you're, you're putting, once you get enough things aggregated in a certain way, then you get consciousness or, or the consciousness yeah. that we think the, the type of phenomenal. So maybe like a rock doesn't have phenomenal consciousness, but it has like right. primordial consciousness or, yeah, so there's there's families of this. So there's panpsychism, and then there's panprotopsychism. Okay. Panprotopsychism is the view that um, so so panpsychism is the view that consciousness is ubiquitous in the universe, but there might there, but there's different kinds of conscious states. Mm -hmm. So th so you know a quark, if quarks exist, has some sort of mental life, but it's really primitive. Yeah. A rock will have something else, but it's really primitive. But when all of the atomic simples, the quarks and whatever the story ends up being, aggregate into the right form and function like a brain, then you get um, a, a macro a subject of consciousness that has the kind of conscious life that we have. The pan protopsychist doesn't think that the consciousness is ubiquitous um, in the world, but they do think that once um, there are these there are these things that are proto conscious. There are these things that have the properties such that when they're in the range in the right way, the the, um, the whole that they compose becomes conscious. Is, is that um, with the proto panpsychist? I'm sure there's a bunch of different types of that too. Would, would yeah. that commit them to certain substrates that that um, so they can still be functionalists maybe, but only certain substrates like carbon or something can produce that? Or no, so um, and that that so yeah, what actually. Um, so what actually motivated philosophers to adopt functionalism was this problem of multi-realizability. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that you could have um, things that are not made of carbon that have experiences. Yeah. And so this, this um, was a problem for the identity th thesis, which just is pain is identical to say a C fiber firing. Mm -hmm. It seems like, no, there are conceivability cases where you've, where you've got something that's in pain, but doesn't have a C fiber firing. So it can't just be identical to C fibers. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be something else. And so um, multi-realizability pain could be realized in all sorts of things, carbon or non-carbon based. Um, and so it's going to be something like um, a function of some things. And so the panpsychist and the, the pan protopsychist are free to be functionalists in, in, in the multi-realizability sense. Okay. Sure. Actually, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, 
I got kind of sucked into this debate because I read so much Searle for my my uh, chapter, and and he's like a biological emergentist, maybe. Um, yeah. And 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 so people I always mess. Naturalist is what he wants to. Yeah, be. yeah, yeah. Um, so people <laughs> will will go at him and say, "Well, you think carbon's the only thing, the only substrate that 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 could, um, you know, be suitable for consciousness?" And he he said, "Well, no, it's just like um." The brain is just like the stomach. The stomach produces, you know, all this stuff, and the brain yeah. produces consciousness. Um, do you think that I, I hadn't really thought of this like as a Christian, really, until right now? Do you think that other substrates could um, suitably, you know, uh, uh, hold consciousness or be subjects of consciousness? Sure. Yeah, angels would be an example. Well, okay, yeah, but but so how about like a phys another physical substrate? Because because I think of angels, you know, I think of God, yeah. right? Or, or soul, right. Dis when we're disembodied. But is there, is yeah. there another like thing? Good, yeah, this is, yeah. Locke sort of asked this question. Um, uh, Locke Locke wasn't dual. So he said, "Look, look, um, couldn't God just super add consciousness to this table and make this table, you know, conscious like a Disney movie or something like?" I mean, he didn't right. he didn't say like a Disney movie, but. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, yeah, I don't think that that's possible because um, the those um, a table has separable parts. Hmm. So my so the so my arguments lead to the conclusion that the only thing that could be conscious is something that la that doesn't have any separable parts. Now, if that now now could it be possible that there are various kinds of things that don't have separable parts? Sure, sure. I, I'm not. I you know that's that's not um, something I've spent time thinking about. Um, but it's the usually the debate tracks along the lines of um, anything that lacks separable parts is going to be a non-physical thing because mm -hmm. physical thing. This is an assumption in the in the early modern era of philosophy, in particular, um, where a lot of these debates were were being had, um, where if something was physical, then it was infinitely divisible. Now I'm not committed to that thesis. Yeah. Um, so so you know presumably, my arguments just show that the subject of phenomenal consciousness can't have separable parts. It doesn't tell us then what kind of things um, can, uh, can be things that don't have separable parts. Well, okay. So, so, so I like that. So God isn't bringing a, a table to life because it has separable parts, but, but I don't, if, if your thesis is right, I don't have separable parts insofar as I am sub essentially uh, my, my substantial soul. Um, yeah. Could, could God put me in that table? Uh, yeah, I mean, presumably he could. Now, it depends on what you mean by put me in the table. Could he make the table my body? Yeah. I want to say no, because bodies are biological organisms that are necessarily in souls, and a table is not a biological organism. Um, so I don't think God could make a table my body or something there, like that. The, the carbon, I, I'm thinking back of like the carbon um, substrate kind of thing. Like, could he... Could he put my soul in like a, a robot body with a? Um, I'm trying to think of another substrate, man, like a, yeah, a yeah. rubber or something. Yeah, some primordial goo. Or yeah, stuff. sure. Exactly. Something different than than what my brain's made out of. Yeah, so <clears throat> it'll come down to what you take it, what what it what it means for a simple subject of consciousness to be um, in in something else. Mm -hmm. And or to stand in the relation of of um, so I I take it that the best evidence that I have suggests that um, simple selves are the sorts of things that can be embodied, mm -hmm. and embodiment has particular ontological um, features. Okay, um, such that a body is what it is because it's in soul. So these are these are sort of neo Aristotelian kinds of principles. Yeah. So. If the relationship that I always stand to the thing that I am, you know, in, so to speak, mm -hmm. my body is is this sort of informing relation, then it can't be the case that I'm put into a table because I can't. So, for example, I can't be put into a dead body if what it means for me to be in something is that I enliven it. Because yeah. if I'm joined to it, there's going to be this oh. relationship such that that body is now alive. Yeah, it would never be dead. It would never, as soon as you were in it or whatever, it's back to life. Right. So sure. yeah. So technically speaking, there, there are no such thing as, you know, dead bodies. There's corpses. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, the, on this on this view. And so, yeah, this is you know Aristotle's you know you know sort of famous you know line of thinking that you know uh, if a hand is severed from a body, it's not a hand anymore. Yeah, Paul Gould hit me with that early last year. Hit you with the hand that's been severed? <laughs> yeah, no, no, <laughs> with the problem. Do that. He's a rapscallion. Paul Gould. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and because he was he was deep into uh, uh, Muriology at that point, and reading through uh, Ross Inman's uh, a book, new book on Muriology, Muriological cool. Holism, and stuff like that, and just super awesome, super crazy stuff. But so, w with your view, um, some the the simple view. Can you say? Can you? How do you? How do you term that again? Right. So um, it's going to come down to this view of what parthood is. So yeah. Husserl, I think everybody agrees, is, has developed the most sophisticated and coherent theory of parthood. Mm -hmm. And he thinks there are two ways for something to be simple. Something is simple and so f uh, if it has no parts at all, uh -huh. or something is simple if it has no separable parts. Yeah. So what it means for something to be a, to have a separable part is it's a technical, this technical, here's my technical, my, my go at, at, um, a technical statement of what Husserl thinks. Um, X is a separable part, separable part of some whole W, if and only if these three things hold. One, X is a particular. Two, X is a part of W. And three, it's possible for X to exist without being a part of W. That's a separable part. Okay. So it's a part that can be removed from the whole and continue to exist. An inseparable part X is an inseparable part of some whole W if um, just like the separable part, it is a particular and it's a part of W. But here's the other, here's the, the distinction is that it's not possible for X to exist apart from or without being a part of W. Yeah. So an inseparable part is a part that can't be removed from the whole of which it is part and continue to exist. Right. So, so go the, back to Aristotle's hand yeah, thing. The hand, yeah. the hand is an inseparable part of a body because um, the hand can't exist without the whole that it's a part of. So, so technically you don't remove a hand from a body. Um, the body just stops having a hand because what you have is this corpse hand. Yeah. It's removed from the body. Yeah. That's so interesting. It, it, just, it changes the way you have to think about, yeah, parts and holes and hands and right. Yeah. Because it, is that because like definitionally a hand is belongs to someone and is able to be used? Uh, it's going to be a, a little more complicated than that. It's going to have to be the case that um, it's going to, so maybe we can talk about um, how it is that I construe holes. Yeah. Um, but, but one way is going to be understanding that um, it's going to have to do with the sorts of relations that the inseparable or separable parts um, have exemplify with respect to the whole that they're a part of. Okay. So a genuine whole, something that's, you know, Leibniz would call a genuine whole, um, is a whole that doesn't have any separable parts. So it can have um, inseparable parts. Mm -hmm. And if it has inseparable parts, in virtue of being an inseparable part, it can only stand in internal relations to the other parts. Okay. Um, so, and for something to be an internal relation, here's another technical definition. R is an internal relation between two things, A and B, if and only if facts about R are grounded in facts about the natures of A and B, and two, necessarily, if R fails to obtain, A and B, A and or B are altered. Okay. Right. So, you, so again, there's this modal distinction between, um, so an internal relation is going to be this relation that stands between a and B such that if that relation fails to hold between A and B, A and or B are altered. Yeah. Okay. That's so, um, so A and B make it the, the organism in the hand, mm -hmm. right? So the relationship that the hand stands to the organism is an internal one. And that entails the case that when the relation of the parthood relation of the hand being a part of the whole organism is removed, that relation no longer corresponds B, the, the, the is changed. The hand is changed and it's yeah. a court hand now. External relations are different. So R is an external relation between A and B. If and only if facts about R are not grounded in facts about the natures of A and B. And two, possibly that relation R fails to hold between A and B while at least A 
or B remain unaltered. Okay. Okay. So, so this is going to be the sort of thing that you could think about, um, you know, just take a, a, a heap of, of uh, sand, the relations among the individual um, grains of sand stand in external relations to one another because you can remove one of the grains of sand such that it doesn't stand in that relation as a, it doesn't stand in the part whole relation to the the heap of sand anymore but the heap that that little grain of sand is remains identical to what it was before which is a little grain of sand yeah so they're externally related to each other and that would be something that is merely a functional whole and not a genuine whole so something that has so the way that it works is um a genuine whole is something that ha that only has, if it does have parts, has separable parts. So it has no inseparable, it has no separable parts. A genuine whole has no separable parts. And in virtue of that, the relations that obtain between the inseparable parts of that whole are all internal. Internal, yeah. An aggregate um, can be a functional whole insofar as it has at least one separable part. The relations between the separable part and the whole of which it's a part are external relations. And at least some of those relations, um, when they're actualized, um, secure some sort of goal or functional, um, uh, 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 yeah, some functional, realize some functional goal. And this is this is like a table, right? A functional whole. Yeah. Aggregate. Good, yeah. So a table is, going, is not going to be a genuine whole. It's going to be an mm -hmm. aggregate of parts. And so you could say it has a functional unity because the way that the parts are aggregated provides the conditions under which something's a table. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. All right. And so that's going to be the case that that's going to be the features of a distinguishing um, subject simplicity from subject complexity. Mm -hmm. And so the arguments are going to be that a phenomenally unified state of consciousness is a genuinely holistic unified thing. Mm -hmm. The only sort of thing that can be a subject of that is going to be something that itself is holistically unified. But the only things that are holistic, uni the only things that can be holistically unified are things without separable parts. That is something that's very logically simple. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay. And so you set us up super well for your arguments against physicalism now because of the, the unity of consciousness. And so, um, yeah, can you just lay that out for us? Like how, how do you argue against uh, uh, physicalism based on uh, that that part whole relation you just developed for us? Right. So the first move is going to say that that physicalism, or, or, or yeah, I can even say just naturalism, just is um, wedded to or entails subject complexity. That is, mm -hmm. if a view of the subject counts as a naturalistic view or a physicalist view, it's going to be one under which the subject of consciousness, phenomenal unified consciousness. Um, has separable a separable part, at least one separable part, and so the so so the way that I go through this is is one I give arguments that just look this is exactly how physicalists talk about their view. So Jeffrey Poland is a physicalist. Here's a quote from him. He says, "To summarize the central ontological idea of physicalism, it is that everything has a place in an ontological structure grounded in the ontology of physics." The physical mm -hmm. ontology is the most basic and comprehensive relative to all there is. And physics is going to explain things in terms of separable parts standing in external relations. In particular, yeah, so, so th 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 that would be, you know, sort of one way to think about it. The other way you could think about it in terms of mechanistic explanations. Physics is, um, uses explanations that are subpersonal, that are mechanistic. And if, and, in order for them to tell us anything about the world, they have to be interpreted um, uh, on realism. And mechanisms are the things that have in, uh, have separable parts that stand in external mm. relation. Mm. So a neuro, you know, a neurotransmitter, for example, here I, you know, an action potential arrives at the cell's axon terminal, that is the presynaptic um, neuron. In so doing, it raises the membrane voltage uh, sufficiently to open. Um, the specific ion channels, right? The result of influx of, you know, th that goes into these ion channels initiates this torrent of intercellular relations. There's there's other things that are part of the story that have to do um, with vesicles and membranes. But the idea here is that 
this mechanistic explanation of consciousness with respect to neurons is one that's told in, term of, in terms of all of these separable parts that are constituents mm -hmm. of the neuronal state. Um, and so, and this is what the physicalist wants uh, to be the case um, for an explanation of consciousness. And so it is, insofar as they use mechanistic explanations, they're wedded to a subject complexity um, view. Another way to catch this out is just in terms of um, the, the the sort of fundamental principles that the physicalist is is committed to. So causal closure is one. Um, uh, ontological and metaphysical realism is another. And the way that Coons and Picavants put it together, they also have a non-intentional or non-teleological fundamentality. But the one that they um, highlight is they call it a bottom-up explanation. All genuine causal explanations have a factual basis consisting of the spatial and kinematic arrangements of some fundamental particles with specific and uh, intrinsic natures. So that that's just to say that physicalism is cashed out by bottom-up explanations, which require there to be separable parts. Yeah. That's that's um, Dennett's uh, uh, crane crane versus skyhook, right? You need a, a bottom up explanation that comes down, right. but we we have a skyhook that comes out of nowhere and drops down right. from the sky. Yeah, right, right, right. So there's you know Barry Lauer and Pettit and others I, I cite here, you know Hillary Putnam. So I basically have one argument that just says, look, this is how they cash it out. So Kim, this is his. He calls the substance physicalism. He says all that exists in the world are bits of matter in space time and aggregate structures composed of bits of matter. There's nothing else in the space-time world. That's clearly subject complexity. The other yeah. argument that I get, oh, sorry. Did oh, you is, that, is that Kim just explaining it or is that Kim saying for himself? Cause he has, you know, qualia stuff going on, doesn't he? Yeah, but they're not causally relevant. Oh, right, right, right. Right, right. Okay. yeah. So he's just stating what, he thinks that phys what physicalism is, is subject physicalism, and and that's just the the definition I gave you is his of okay. subject physicalism, and that's him attempting to characterize just what the physicalist view is. Okay. The second argument that I give again that tries to wed subject complexity to physicalism is the thesis that what motivates physicalism often is um, this thesis that neuroscientists ne neuroscience rather um, is. Uh, shows us that physicalism is true because consciousness is reducible to what's going on at the neurological level. Yeah. And the argument here is just that um, the way that the neuroscientists talk about, so maybe you'd say, uh, maybe it's at the fundamental level, it's not just an arrangement of particles. Maybe it's fields at the fundamental level. And so you don't have separable parts um, standing in external relations at the field level, the fundamental field level. Well, the physicalist is is going to want to have their view saddled with and and uh, a an out yeah supported by the neuroscientific data, but the neuroscientific data is cashed out with a high degree um, of separable parts standing in external relations. So the idea here is that if the neuroscience is science oh sorry if the physicalist is going to use neuroscience, um, they're going to have to then assume or be wedded to a theory about the ontology of subjects of consciousness such that they have separable parts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, 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 and in this chapter, I work out various details, some of which I think I've already talked about, um, about the, the, the neurostructure of um, both the brain at the, at the larger level, but then even at the smaller level, um, you have radical aggregation with just with respect to um, the neurons. So for, for any synaptic ves vesicle, there's there's at least 100, and on the high uh, spectrum, um, 200. Uh, so for, for every neuron, sorry, there's 100 to 200 synaptic vesicles. But those synaptic vest vesicles then have several thousands of ion channels that constitute them. Oh. So any single synaptic cleft then is going to have roughly 300,000 separable parts. Right. Yeah. So then the average brain in, in virtue of take, taking those parts and other parts into account is going to have about roughly 100 billion neurons. So you've got now 100 billion separable parts, the constituents of, wi the constituents of which have even more separable parts going down. Yeah. So you have this high level of aggregation at the neurological explanation. 
and the could, and the physicalist is wedded to that. Could they argue a similar way as, as Aristotle and say, well, the the brain is a is a myriological whole. Yeah, it has parts, but they're inseparable parts. Could you take out one of the 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 clefts, or if you take out one of the uh, the uh, ion chambers or whatever, like it's it's not functioning on its own. Are are they able to make that myriological case? I don't think so because because the assumption there is that I get a conclusion about um, the holistic unity of the brain from a fact about the functional unity of some part. Mm. So it doesn't seem that you can argue from a premise about the functional unity present in the parts of the brain to the holistic unity of the brain. Okay. That's a that, fallacy. And that holistic unity of the or function of the brain, that's what well, that's what gives us the binding problem, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. The brain is just going to have these various regions. So I think I mentioned before, like if you have uh, we we know that the very there's various regions of the brain that are uh, segregated from each other, that are individually responsible for or correlated with very specific types of experiences. Mm -hmm. So we know that um, we know that that V4, for example, is correlated with or partially responsible for color perception because if part of V4 ends up having a brain lesion or some sort of damage to it, the person will end up losing their or they'll have an impairment. Um, in their uh, in their color perception, right? Or there'll be other places of the brain too. So, like um, the uh, the parietal lobes um, are correlated to both perception of the size of some particular object and the location of that particular object. Yeah. The binding problem is about how it is that you get all these different areas of the brain bound together such that you have one experience that's phenomenally unified, the kind of yeah. experience that we have. But yeah. again. The neuroscience is telling us that the subject of consciousness, the brain, or the whole biological animal, if you want to go the animalist route, um, has all of these separable parts that stand in inter uh, external relations uh, to one another. Mm -hmm. So that is, on physicalism, if you're going to go with the neuroscientific data, is going to be committed to subject complexity. Yeah, okay, and that's that's a problem for the unity of consciousness. Right. So that, so that, that's going to be, yeah. So the, the, this first premise or this premise of the argument is just to say, if physicalism is true, then subject complexity is true. Yeah. Another argument I give has to do with the primary argument for physicalism, which has to do with the uh, success, supposedly successful history of reductive explanations. But, you know, we can't go into all the details of that. Yeah. So, so what we get then is I've got to give arguments for why it is then so we, we know that physicalism is wedded to or entails subject complexity, but now we need an argument for why subject complexity is inconsistent with um, or yeah creates problems for a sub a subject being a f uh, for there being a subject of phenomenal unified consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and so th this argument actually what I found so fascinating about the argument as I put it together is this has been an argument that has popped up. Um, throughout the history of philosophy. So people usually um, in the contemporary literature will cite William James as the one who sort of came up with a particular thought experiment, mm -hmm. but it actually goes all the way back to Plato. Mm -hmm. So in the Theotetus, right? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So in the Theotetus, Plato gives this argument that says, look, um, if, if five of us or a couple of us are individual persons inside of some Trojan horse, it wouldn't make sense for the perce for perceptions to be divided among us and for there to be one thing that perceives them. That's the Chinese nation argument, right? It, yeah, swarm of bees, Chinese nation. I yeah. mean, it's all of these sorts of things that are coming in. Plotinus yeah. then really develops um, uh, the argument. In the medieval mm -hmm. era, you have people like Avicenna and uh, John um, Olivier developing this slightly, but when it really gets... Um, going is in the early modern period. So there's a hint of it in Descartes. Um, Locke, not a dualist, gives a type of simplicity argument for the simplicity of God. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't think that substance dualism is true, but he thinks God's simple, and he gives this unity of consciousness argument for God. Leibniz gives several of them, not just the the, the mill. Um, Reed gives them. Uh, Joseph, Joseph Butler um Henry Moore, Ralph Cudworth does a bunch of really great work on this. So does Samuel Clark, John Smith, Lotz, um, and Pierre Boyle. Um, and 
Clark is the one who actually comes up with the example that I think Block's argument is based off. I'm not claiming that Block plagiarized it. I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> um, I no, I'm not saying that at all. Um, but the the idea there is, um, or here here's another way to put this sort of thing is just take five individuals. I think this is the way that Hasker the the way that Hasker um, motivates this kind of explanation. This 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 platonic sort of argument. Um, imagine you've got five people, and you ha and the, and you have a sentence with five words. Mm -hmm. Each individual person knows one and only one word of the sentence, and each person knows a different word of the sentence. Does it entail that, in virtue of each individual person knowing one and only one word and a different word from anyone else, that the group of them knows the sentence? Mm. No, that that doesn't follow at all. I mean, so just good. try it out. It's really helpful. Right. Um, or, you know, the way I've explained it to my students, you know, just imagine that there there's an exam with 25. You know, actually, our, I think our classes are capped at 18. So 18 questions, 18 students. Each of them knows the answer to one and only one question and a different one from everyone else. Does it follow mm -hmm. that the class is going to know the answers to the whole test? No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. There doesn't seem to be this thing called the class that experiences um, an awareness of the answers to all 18 questions. Yeah. Right. So the, you know, the nation of China is similar. Um, it, again, like I said, Clark, Clark just gives the nation of China, but he doesn't, he doesn't talk about in terms of um, people in China, but the nation of China experiment is look, let's just take every single nation of uh, every single person um, in the nation of China and have them function just like a neuron does. And maybe separate them out. They do it with, you know, walkie-talkies or something like that. It seems absurd then to think that the nation of China becomes this thing that's the subject of phenomenal unified consciousness. Yeah. So that these are the sorts of um, thought experiments that pump the intuition that a thing compose the thing that has separable parts can't be a subject of phenomenal unified consciousness. Yeah. And so I want to say. Um, how can we bolster that into a particular argument? And the way that I do it in, in develops a sort of contemporary um, version of Plotinus's argument, which is just to say, well, let's consider the various properties that these parts can have. Um, and if these separable parts have them, could it, in virtue of having those properties, be a subject, mm. right? So go through um, various forms of of the argument. So I've got what I call the anti-distribution argument. That's just to say that, um, per, uh, assume this particular view. So perhaps the view is sort of like the nation of China, that the phenomenal unified state of consciousness has particular um, parts of it, the experience of red, the hearing of a conversation, the smell of coffee that are dispersed or, or had by um, a scatter of the individual neurons within a brain. It, in virtue of those like like the test or like the sentence, it just doesn't seem plausible that um, the neurons, each of which have that that um, state of consciousness, aggregate into a subject of consciousness. Now, now what's what's not right about about um, Bloch's argument, I think, is is that, and the way that I'm giving it is that I'm not giving in terms of physicalism because in the physicalist story. The neurons don't host the phenomenal states. Yeah, the neurons are non-conscious states, and they mm -hmm. work to, um, on the functionalist theory, um, realize a particular function that, in virtue of that, the brain becomes conscious. Yeah. So it's really that for this unified phenomenal state E, individual parts of it um, are the content of them are distributed to the parts. So, so in the nation of uh, the Chinese the, nation argument, the, the Chinese people aren't even conscious. Yeah, the Chinese people aren't conscious. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That that's that's a consistent way. So you've got this scattered parts, you know, view. The subject X has this phenomenal holistically unified phenomenal state E, in virtue of S's separable parts individually processing specific sense modalities, mm -hmm. and that seems to be the sort of thing that um, is just like that the. the um, the class test example or the five people and the um, sentence um, question. 
So there, there are others that I give. We can't go through through all, all of them, of course. Mm -hmm. um, pro tip, if you're writing a dissertation, it's fun to give the members of your dissertation different neurological disorders. <laughs> That's fun for when they read it. <laughs> so um, I just mentioned what I call the no phenomenal parts problem. So that's that's the issue. If you recognize that the physicalist is wedded to the thesis that those parts aren't do not carry the phenomenal content of the exp of the of the unified uh, phenomenal state, then it seems even more implausible that by carrying the non phenomenal parts, whatever that would mean exactly, is totally unclear to me. Yeah. But they would they would they would carry in um, the in process the non phenomenal information of a phenomenal state, and have it aggregated in such a way that it becomes the subject of the phenomenal unified state. Yeah. But it does that in virtue of the non phenomenal facts. Yeah. So well, again, you you run into a sort of explanatory gap, but it's worse because you've got to have the explain. It's not merely getting phenomenal facts from physical facts. It's getting phenomenally unified facts from uh, phenomenally uh, non-phenomenally disunified facts. Yes, that's so good. I, I wonder if someone would say, I, I I see this so closely related to to emergentism. If someone says like, well, yeah, but need a single a single molecule of H2O isn't wet, but you put right. enough of them together and wetness emerges. And right. yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, the, the, uh, <coughs> I forgot the, the Greek name for whatever, but it's like the, the fallacy of the heap to ask me or, or a paradox of the heap, but the fallacy of, um, uh, of drawing a, a, a line. Um, I forgot the fallacy, but, uh, it would, it'd be silly for you to ask me at what point, how many neurons, you know, in, until the brain is wet, until the brain is conscious. What, what do yeah. you say to that? Righties problems, right? Yeah. 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 So, um, so one is that is, is to just to say, um, right now I'm just dealing with standard physicalism. Okay. So I want to say if, if the solution is to, is to pause at emergentism, you jump then ship. We, yeah. Then we need to pause and say, okay, let's go there, but recognize yeah. you've abandoned standard physicalism. Nice. Okay. That's good. That's a, that's a win then. Right. So I might just say like, that's good enough. Hey, that was, you know, I've, I've done, you know, I don't right. get my whole argument, but Hey, that's some, that's some progress. That's some philosophical okay. progress. Okay. The chapter that I deal with on emergentism, which we'll, I think we'll talk about next time. I'll go into more of those details. But the thing that I'll say for, for right now is that a thesis of emergentism does not seem at all to be a solution to any of this or an account of what's going on. It seems to be a statement of the problem in the same way that Jaguan Kim points out, you can't solve um, mental causation by positing supervenience mm. because the supervenience relation, right? The, the supervenience relation being that um, a, a supervenes on B just in case there can't be a change in A without a change in B. Yeah. And some people posited supervenience as some sort of account of mental causation and, 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 and Kim and others come along and say, no, that, that, that's just the problem. You've just stated the problem. And I think that's the thing to say against the, the emergentist theory too. To say that you somehow get um, a qualitative property, say wetness, from an emergent feature of, uh, or an emergent law that kicks in when you get the right arrangement of molecules is just to state the problem of how do you get wetness from, how do you get qualitative states from non-qualitative states? Yeah. Or how you get wetness from the experience. Yeah, that would be the experience of wetness or how you get wetness from um, the aggregation of molecules. Another thing to point out, too, is that the, the examples that are always given of emergence um, that might seem intuitive are not examples of phenomenal states. Yeah. So wetness is not the same as the experience of presumably the experience of wetness. Yeah, that's good. That, so it's an argument by analogy, but there's there's considerable there disanalogy. Now, right. The properties of an ecosystem that the, that the emergence says are not reducible to the parts of an ecosystem are not phenomenal facts. Mm -hmm. So one, you could say, let's grant emergentism at the level that you point out as being examples of emergentism. They don't give us any reason to think that consciousness is emergent because it's a, there's a radical disanalogy between the two. Yeah, that's good. 
That's really good. So, so, so uh, going back to, to physicalism, uh, unit, the unity of consciousness, uh, physicalism is, is committed to this, this aggregate view. Can you say that again? What, what's the, what's it called? What's it called? Yeah, the sub- name of it? Complexity that a subject of consciousness has, um, has at least one uh, separable part that stands in external relations and therefore can only be functionally unified. Yeah. But, but functional unity is not the type of unity needed for the unity of consciousness. Right. That's a holistic, genuine kind of unity. So there's a problem for, for physicalism then. And with, with that, I think a, 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 maybe an added bonus is insofar as uh, functionalism is, is on the line here that if your argument succeeds against functionalism that means that we can never make a uh agi which has a unity of consciousness yeah is the which is the subject of a phenomenally unified consciousness yeah dude that's sweet people are gonna be upset about that yeah and, and and i think a whole bunch of stuff follows from that because i think that if you don't have a phenomenal unified state of consciousness um at a time or over time you um you can't have any justification or knowledge Yes. So, um, you know, there's okay. that, that, that sort of this, and Chisholm gives a little, like a hint at this argument um, or brief statement of it. So again, I'm not claiming any um, originality there, um, but that's an argument to be developed too, I think. Really important argument to be developed. Um, another, so here's one other argument that I'll explain in terms of physicalism. So this I call the phenomenal unity drainage argument. So yeah. give whatever you, you know, let's just, let's just, so this argument is inspired by the um, causal drainage argument, um, and um, I make uh, the, um, Todd Beers and I make use of that as a version of the argument from reason to um, reply to Peter Vanenwagen's criticism of um, the argument from reason. And the idea here is that um, look, if physicalism is true, anything that has any sort of causal efficacy at the mental state Mm -hmm. is going to be causally explained by the causal efficacy of the parts below that Mm -hmm. and then the parts below that and then the parts below that until you get to the atomic symbols. What that tells us is then is that there's not really such a thing as mental causation. The, the causation at that level is actually drained away to the, the um, microscope to the, the atomic simple level. And so I want to say there's a way to put that argument together with um, different, you know, with specific facts about phenomenal unity. <coughs> so um, let me get this straight here. Well, so yes. Yeah, so so following up on that on, on that argument from reason with the drainage, that means that uh, if the the cause drains all the way down to the subatomic level, then anything you know produced uh, all the way up is produced by the laws of physics and not, you know, laws of logic or not, not reasoning. Is that, is that how the argument goes? Yeah. So the way that, that, that the Todd and I put it together is that we, we want to make a distinction between two types of reasons. And, mm-hmm. and this is similar to the way that, um, that Lewis wants to put it. So there are these, the way that we do it also tracks with how Swinburne divides the space, the logical space. So you've got these personal explanations and these mechanistic explanations. Yeah. And a personal explanation um, is going to be the type of thing that we refer to with respect to reasons. Mm-hmm. Reasons are going to be personal explanation or good because they're always going to be um, reasons that an individual has to believe X. Yeah. But the drainage we want to say happens so that you, the personal explanation, if, if physicalism is true, the personal explanation gets drained away to the mechanistic explanation. Yeah. And so you don't have any, if you don't have personal explanations, but only subpersonal re- explanations, then reasons can't stand as explanations. Yeah. So you can't ever have a thesis according to which anyone holds a belief in virtue of the reasons for that belief. Yeah. They hold that belief in terms of some uh, subpersonal facts. Including that belief itself. Yeah. So good. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. So what's nice is this version of the argument doesn't have anything to do with debates about free will. That just doesn't have to come up. And those debates are kind of messy. Definitely. Um, Yeah. yeah. So, so that's how this works. So the phenomenal 
um, unity drainage problem, unity drainage problem works that way. So the way that I state it just sort of simply here is a physicalism is true, then the phenomenal unity powers at the macro physical level are drained away by the functional unity powers at the micro level. Okay. So if, what that means then is that the phenomenal unity um, powers never obtain. So a way to think about this is, well, let's just assume for reductio that the physicalist can have um, powers at the level of neural states that are phenomenally unified or in a, in a holistic sense. They're genuine unities. Well, at the level of the, um, the at the level of the atomic relations among the parts, the, the atomic symbols that constitute the brain or the neurons, those are not holistically unified. Those are merely functionally unified. Yeah. Because and and we know that because they're at, they are um, separable parts that merely stand in external relations to one another. So if the powers that are at work fundamentally are non-unitary or not not genuinely not genuinely holistic powers, then and and they're merely functionally unified unity powers. Those powers drain away the genuine whole powers at the level of phenomenal consciousness. Yeah. And you have the same sort of problem there. Even if you assume for the sake of argument that the naturalist, the physicalist can have um, genuine phenomenal unity at the level of mental states. Yeah. Dude, Those that's a good argument. You're drained away. Yes. By the oh, function. that's good. What, um, what about like a, a, a Dennett who says, who might say like, we don't have, what would Dennett? What would Dennett say? Would he say that we don't have a unity of consciousness, anyways? Well, yeah, because there's no we. Yeah. So okay. he thinks that there's no subject, and he thinks that there there really are no phenomenal states. That those that it's an illusion. Yeah. We so, have a strong illusion that we have phenomenal states, and there's a strong illusion that there is such a thing as a self. So would he just reject this whole argument from the beginning and say, "I don't, I don't even believe in any of that," anyways? Yeah, that that's how he would be. Yeah, that's how it'd be. He would be out of it, and then say, "Well." Who just said that to me? And it's like, well, yeah, yeah. You could go the Augustine, yeah, the Augustine sort of response to the skeptic. I think that, yeah, you could do that. But then, I mean, I think another way to sort of point this out is just to say that that entails then that almost every philosopher and every neuroscientist working on the unity problems, phenomenal unity or the binding problem are trying to explain something that just isn't real. And that seems really, really uncharitable to say all of these scholars are totally deluded, right? So there's this principle of charity that you might think that that just doesn't sound right. But then you ask the question, uh, this is a stronger reason, you just ask the question, why are these philosophers and neuroscientists stuck on this problem? And they're all going to say, because the most salient feature of my experience yeah. is that it's phenomenally unified. Yeah. Or the way that I put it in a, in a different chapter is that... Um, the, f the fact um, that my phenomenal state of consciousness is phenomenally unified is a Morian fact. And a mm -hmm. Morian fact is something that I've got more justification to believe in than any one single premise that would work as an argument against that fact. Yeah. So you just, then it gives me all the evidence he wants to about my consciousness not being phenomenally unified. None of that evidence can outweigh the evidence that I have of my experiences being phenomenally unified. Especially because when you're maybe not especially, but you when he's telling you that you're experiencing that in a phenomena, phenomenally unified manner. Yeah. So so yeah. So you do end up getting this this sort of um, kind another kind of argument from reason because um, what is the thing you're in? What is the thing that you're saying doesn't have the property of reasonable belief in? a subject of phenomenal unified consciousness. Mm. To what thing are you attributing that false belief? Yeah. He's going to say to nothing, right? Because there are no cells. Yeah. So what's your argument then? Your argument is that something there's something that doesn't exist that should hold the belief that it doesn't exist. Yes. Oh man. It's a it's a weird sort of thing and and you know, maybe that's a sort of like cute and clever argument. And maybe it maybe it doesn't do all the work we want it to, but it certainly points out a really strong implausibility and uh, the non-intuitive nature of those views. 
So I yeah. just say, if you want to get rid of phenomenal consciousness or phenomenal unified consciousness, um, go ahead. But now you've gotten rid of yourself. Yeah. And that yeah. that's going to be a, any 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 ontology or metaphysics that makes it the case that I don't exist is I just can't take that seriously. Yeah, like Literally. I can't. Yeah, like I can't. Take that seriously. That's huge. Yeah. So this horn for the, for the naturalist, and you can go the Dennett route, which. You know, uh, or you could go uh, the the other route, but but that has all the problems from the arguments you've raised thus far. Um, you, right. I really like the drainage one. That's that's fantastic. But all of them, yeah. So you have these problems for if you're a physicalist, naturalist, trying to make sense of the unity of consciousness, which is like so fundamental to our our being, our ex existence and experience. Right, and there's other arguments I give. To, and they're all going to face, you know, particular objections, and then and then and then the chapter I I try to deal with those um, yeah. objections. Um, so I don't yeah. want to make it the case that this is just an argument that can't be answered. I think it does have objections, but I think those objections fail. Well, um, dude, this, this is awesome. So in in part three, we're going to go over. We looked at, at physicalism. Now um, we're going to go over uh, Russellian, Russ Russellian, uh, Russellian, pan, yeah, panpsychism. Yeah, pan Psychism, and then uh, emergentism as well. So that's going to be part three. We're going to look at the unity of consciousness and how it, uh, I think, poses huge problems for those, as, as you've, uh, I think, successfully uh, put in your dissertation there. And then, um, Lord willing, we can go into some more uh, random questions at the at the end of next one as well. Yeah, that's fun. Well, awesome, Brandon. Thanks again for for this part two, man. Thanks for all your effort and your time explaining this to us. Um, I, I hope the listeners are following along. Um, re-listen to it. You're gonna have. I'm gonna have to re-listen to it too. But uh, it's awesome, and you sharpen us all because of your work. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Well, um, if you guys are listening to this, um, go ahead and listen to part three. Um, it's gonna be awesome. I'm excited for it. So uh, we're gonna continue this conversation in part three. Uh, that's going to have to do it for this episode, though. Uh, as always, um, well, this has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.